Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. If this is your first time here, and you're somebody who enjoys listening to horror stories, join us by clicking subscribe down below, and please leave a like before we get started. Thank you. My name is Sarah, and I've always been a bit of a couch potato. I never really had the motivation to exercise or eat healthy. But one day, something changed. I decided that I was going to train for the New York Marathon. The thought of running 26.2 miles through the bustling streets of the city sounded like a challenge that I was ready to take on. I made the decision then and there that I was going to run it, but I knew that I couldn't just jump into it. I needed to train and actually get in shape. I did some research and found out that the marathon was only six months away. That gave me just enough time to get ready. I started my training the next day. I would wake up at 5 a.m and go for a run around my neighborhood. At first, it was tough. I could barely make it a mile without feeling like I was going to pass out. But I pushed through, and gradually increased my distance. I also changed my diet. I cut out all the junk food, and started eating more fruits, vegetables, and lean protein. It wasn't easy, but I knew it was necessary if I wanted to reach my goal. I also started drinking more water and less soda. As the weeks went by, I could feel myself getting stronger and faster. I no longer dreaded my morning runs. In fact, I looked forward to them. I even started to enjoy the feeling of my heart pounding and my lungs burning. It was a sign that I was making progress. But it wasn't just about getting in shape for me. I wanted to run the marathon for a cause. I decided to raise money for a charity that was close to my heart. Cancer Research. I'd lost my grandfather to cancer a few years ago, and I wanted to do something to honor his memory. I set up a fundraising page and shared it on social media. The response was overwhelming. Friends, family, and even strangers donated to my cause. It gave me even more motivation to push myself during my training. As the marathon drew closer, I knew I needed to step up my game. I decided to look for a trainer to help me prepare. I didn't have much money spare, but I was determined to find someone who could guide me and push me to my limits. I searched Craigslist and came across an ad. It was from a personal trainer who specialized in marathon training. His name was Ryan, and he had run the New York Marathon multiple times according to his profile. I sent him a message explaining my situation and my goal to run the marathon and raise money for charity. To my surprise, he replied within a few hours, and we set up a meeting at a nearby park for the next day. I was nervous, but also excited to meet him and see if he would get me to be one of the people to reach their goals. When I arrived at the park, I saw a tall, muscular man with a friendly smile waiting for me. He introduced himself as Ryan, and we got straight to business. He asked me about my training routine, my diet, and even some personal stuff about my family. I could tell that he was impressed with how far I'd come just on my own. We started our training session with a warm-up, and then moved on to some running drills that he taught me how to do. Ryan pushed me harder than I'd ever pushed myself. He corrected my form and gave me tips on how to improve my speed and endurance. I could feel my muscles burning, but I didn't want to give up. 
I was so determined to show Ryan that I was serious about this. After the training session, we sat down and talked about my goals and expectations. Ryan was a great listener, and he understood my reasons for wanting to run the marathon. He told me that he would be happy to train me for a discounted price since I was doing it for charity. I couldn't believe my luck. I found an amazing trainer who was not only helping me achieve my goal, but also supporting me in my fundraising efforts. I thanked him and we set up a training schedule for the next few months leading up to the marathon. Running has been a passion since I was a kid, but after a while, after dropping out of high school, I became a couch potato and did absolutely nothing with my life. I've always dreamt of completing a marathon, so when I heard that the New York was just coming up, I jumped at the opportunity to participate. Ryan was a seasoned marathon runner and had completed the New York marathon course multiple times. He was known for his intense training techniques and had a reputation for transforming average runners into pretty far sub three hour guys. When I first met him, I was intimidated by his muscular physique and his pretty stern demeanor. But as we started training together, I realized that he was a kind and dedicated trainer who wanted nothing but the best for me. As the weeks went by, Ryan and I spent a lot of time together. We would meet early in the morning for our runs and spend hours in the gym working on strength, conditioning and endurance. During our training sessions, Ryan would share his knowledge and his experience with me. He was a great motivator and always pushed me to do better. I could feel myself getting stronger and faster with each passing day. I was grateful to have him by my side. However, as our training progressed, I started noticing a change in Ryan's behavior. He would often make inappropriate comments and constantly try to touch me in a flirty manner. At first, I simply brushed it off, thinking it was just his way of joking around. But as time went on, his behavior became more and more frequent. I started feeling uncomfortable around him and began to avoid him outside of our training sessions. One day, while we were out for a run, Ryan confessed his feelings for me. He told me that he had developed strong feelings for me and couldn't stop thinking about me. I was taken aback by his confession and politely told him that I was married. I thought that would be the end of it. But Ryan didn't give up. He started getting possessive and jealous whenever I mentioned my husband. I tried to distance myself from Ryan, but he was my trainer and I'd come so far with him. New York was only four weeks out and it wasn't like I could just quit now, but I probably should have. I didn't want to let go of my dreams but every training session became more and more uncomfortable as Ryan's feelings for me grew stronger. I started feeling scared and didn't really know what to do. One night, my husband and I went out for a romantic dinner to celebrate our anniversary. For me, this was my first kind of junk food meal since I started New York training. Oh boy, was it good. As we were walking back to our car, I thought I noticed a guy who looked like Ryan standing across the street from us. I looked, but then quickly dismissed it, thinking that he was probably out for a run, or it was just a guy that looked like him. But when we got home 20 minutes later, we found the door to our house slightly open, but the lights turned off. My heart started pounding with fear as I realized that someone had broken into our house. As we cautiously entered the house, we found Ryan standing in the living room with a knife in his hand. He had a crazed look in his eyes as he lunged towards my husband. I screamed and ran towards him, 
trying to stop what he was trying to do. Ryan was too strong, and in the struggle, my husband got stabbed in the arm several times. I quickly called the police after my husband knocked Ryan out. They arrived in just enough time to stop Ryan from causing further harm not only to us, but himself. If my husband hadn't have knocked him out, he would have most likely killed both of us. It turned out that Ryan confessed to planning on getting rid of my husband so that he could have me all to himself. He had set up the break-in to make it look like a robbery gone wrong. Thankfully, my husband's injuries were not life-threatening. And he made a full recovery. Ryan was arrested and charged with attempted murder and break-in. As I sat in the courtroom, watching Ryan being sentenced, I couldn't help but feel a mix of emotions. I was grateful that my husband was safe, but I also felt a sense of betrayal and disappointment towards Ryan. I had trusted him and looked up to him as my trainer, but he had turned out to be a dangerous and obsessive person. In the end, I still ran the New York City Marathon and completed it with a scooper time of 4 hours and 3 minutes. But the experience has left a scar on my heart. I couldn't help but wonder if I had missed any signs of Ryan's dangerous obsession with me. Nevertheless, I learned a valuable lesson. To always trust my instincts, and never let anyone manipulate me, even if they are a person in a position of power. I'd always dreamed of owning a luxury car, something that would turn heads and make me feel like I'd truly made it in life. I came across a listing on Craigslist for a rebuilt Aston Martin Vantage 2013. I couldn't believe my luck. The car looked stunning in the photos and the price was a steal at only $50,000. Side note, story written in 2016. I quickly contacted the seller and set up a meeting to see the car in person. When I arrived at the designated location, I was met by a man who introduced himself as Max. He seemed friendly enough and showed me around the car, pointing out all the new parts and upgrades that had been done during the rebuilding process. With rebuilds, you can't see everything, but there were other things he did like a new battery, spark plugs, etc. I took the car for a test drive, and it felt like a dream. Smooth, powerful, and everything I'd ever wanted in a car. Without hesitation, I wired Max the money, and he handed me the keys. I was on cloud nine as I drove my new Aston Martin Vantage home. But my excitement was short-lived. Just 20 minutes into my drive, the car suddenly started sputtering, and the engine died. I pulled over to the side of the road, my heart racing with panic. I tried to start the car again, but it wouldn't even turn over. It was then that I realized something really bad had gone wrong. Feeling angry and betrayed, I called my friend Alex and told him what had happened. He agreed to come help me tow the car back to Max's house. I was determined to get my money back, and make this con artist pay for what he had done. As we pulled up to Max's house, I could see him standing outside, waiting for us. He seemed to be smoking, just stood on his porch. As we approached, I noticed something weird. There was a weapon that he was concealing behind his t-shirt. I saw it as he turned around and faced towards his door. My heart sank as I realized that this situation 
was about to get much worse, or at least had the potential to get worse. Alex and I got out of the car, but Max was already making his way towards us with a menacing look on his face. Before we could even say a word, he pulled out the gun and pointed it at us. I told you, there's no refunds. He sneered, his hand shaking slightly as he held his finger over the trigger. I could feel the fear creeping up inside me, but I refused to back down. I demanded that he give me my money back, but Max just laughed and told me to leave before things got ugly. As he spoke, I noticed that his eyes were glared over, and he seemed to be high on something. But I wasn't about to let him get away with this. I had worked hard for that money, over years and years, decades and decades, and I wasn't going to let some scumbag take it from me like this. Without even thinking, anger got the better of me. I lunged forward and grabbed a gun from his hand, had he have not been high, he probably would have shot me in the head, but he was totally out of it, his reaction times were awful, and he was extremely weak. The sudden movement seemed to startle him. He stumbled backwards, giving me the opportunity to run towards the car and grab the briefcase. Inside the briefcase was my friend's gun. He had told me not to open this case unless it was a life or death situation. As I turned back to run to Alex, I heard the sound of a gunshot and I felt a searing pain in my shoulder. The gun that Max had dropped, he had somehow managed to recover in a matter of seconds, shooting me. I fell to the ground clutching my shoulder as blood poured out of the wound. I had not enough time to grab the gun that had come with Alex's briefcase. I could hear Alex screaming my name, but my vision was starting to blur and I could feel myself slipping into unconsciousness. The next thing I knew, I was in a hospital bed with Alex sitting by my side. His arm was in a sling and he had a bandage over his chin. He explained that after I had been shot, he tackled Max and managed to get the gun away from him before calling for an ambulance. This was probably the best bet over having a shootout with him in the middle of a neighborhood. I was lucky to be alive, but the whole ordeal had left me traumatized. The police were able to track down Max and he was arrested, but it didn't change the fact that I'd lost $50,000 and almost lost my life. My grandparents have both been in a care home since 2015. They used to live together in their own house, but it got to a point where they could no longer take care of each other or themselves. We didn't want to lose their dignity. We didn't want to watch them lose their pride. So we came up with the idea of giving them two options. Either they can come and live with us but that would be a lot of stress on us. Or they could go into a home. They both decided that they wanted to go into the home, which me and my mum found a bit bizarre, as that response was extremely unexpected. Whilst they were in the home, it took them a while to settle in. They shared the same bedroom. It was spacious. According to them, the food was good, and the staff and nurses on site were kind and lovable. My grandma doesn't really tend to socialize with many people, but if she's saying the nurses are nice, then oh boy, they are definitely nice. My granddad's the one that's always trying to please people. He would always crack jokes, he would always try and make people happy, 
and he was always the guy that used to buy me all the best presents at Christmas. He still does. Male, 21. I've been taking care of my grandparents when they first both fell ill in around 2013. It got unmanageable, and to the point where me and my mum were going round basically every single hour. Neither of them can walk properly, they have bad arthritis, and my grandma is starting to develop some bad memory loss, along with another host of issues that I don't really need to go into. When we got them into the care home, things took a while to set up. The paperwork, the legal side, the fees, and of course, the insane cost. But eventually, they made themselves comfortable and settled into their new home. I got a bit lonely after a while. As I'll be honest, I'm a bit like my grandma. I don't have much of a social life. I only have one or two friends that I see maybe twice a week. And other than going to college, I just sit on my laptop all day. I'm a bit embarrassed to admit that, but how else do you think I'm typing this story right now? So, I shall continue. I miss seeing my grandparents, and at first I thought to myself, Phew, now they're off my chest, I won't have to keep going round to take care of them. But they really were like my friends, they took care of me and I soon realised how selfish that feeling was. Not only was it selfish, but not even an ounce of it was true. I had words with my mum, and I started going up to the care home around once a week to visit them. That wasn't enough though, and I know my granddad wanted to see me a lot more, so I began going up every single evening, making the 20 minute or so walk up there. While I was at the care home, I would find myself doing odd jobs helping some of the nurses and carers. Now disclaimer, I wasn't administering any medication, I wasn't interfering in any certain jobs, it was just basic things, like cleaning down some shelves, dusting areas, and changing bedding. I never did any of the serious stuff, as I wasn't allowed to. This care home was family run, so they're a little less strict when it comes to the rules and regulations, but they still take health and safety very seriously. As I started helping around at the care home, I got to know some of the other residents in it. A lot of them were senile, had severe cases of dementia, and were in a lot of pain most of the day. One of the most common causes of this was because they just felt lonely. Granted they had some really bad diseases that were obviously physical, the worst pain I saw in most of their eyes was that they had no kids, or they had kids but the kids refused to come and visit them. Some had no visitors, while others would on average have some once a month. Once a week was a good pointer, but I was seen as spoiling my grandparents. That was alright. For the time being, while I was at college during the day, I was happy to do this. But, when I get a job, I knew this wouldn't be possible at all. Talking of jobs, I soon realised how I got on with most of the residents. I kind of related to them. I tried to help them through their suffering. Be it cracking jokes, talking to them, reading them a bedtime story, all the types of things you would do with people either extremely old or extremely young. When you come into this world, you're incapable, and as you go slowly out of it, you also turn incapable. The only difference is old people still have their ego, they still have the humility, and sometimes they feel like they've been violated if someone is taking care of them. That was a depressing part for me. But it didn't really get me down, and I didn't allow it. After all, I wasn't even being paid to do this, and I did it out of the goodwill of my heart. I realised that I had a talent for doing this, so I started looking online for jobs as a carer for elderly people. In-home elderly care was booming, there was such a high demand for it, seeing nowadays the economy's fucked, and the parents have to both work full time, meaning that the kids are either in daycare, 
have some kind of a minder, or they end up having to have the grandparents look after them. But what happens when the grandparents become sick? What happens when the grandparents can't take care of themselves? Well, nine times out of ten, they're put in a care home. And for a lot of middle-aged people, this is their biggest fear growing old. I realized that I could get this and work with it. The pay was very good, depending on what your clients were and obviously how much money they were willing to pay. I decided that I would put an ad up on Craigslist with an hourly rate of $20 to $30 per hour. I thought this was reasonable, but I said I was willing to negotiate. The next thing I went and did was get a full criminal records check of my background. I got a certificate for that, then I did a first aid course and a medical training course. That took me quite a while, over a whole month of training. Once I got the certificate for that, I added it up on the ad. Then I got more certificates. There's a lot of training that went into this, and as you probably imagine by now, I fully immersed myself and took this venture extremely seriously. During all this training, I didn't have as much time to visit my grandparents, but when I had time, I went there. Eventually, I got some people reaching out to me through the ad. Most of them were people inquiring about their elderly mothers or fathers. Elderly mothers and fathers that lived alone and had certain conditions that meant they couldn't care for themselves. I tried to put myself in the shoes of the daughters and sons calling on behalf of their parents. Would you trust a stranger going into your parents' home, taking care of them? The belongings, all of the jewellery, some of the things worth money. This is what motivated me to do every background check and course that was possibly available. But nothing ever beats reviews. When you're a business that does something like this, you need that clientele and you need those positive reviews. That's something I didn't have. And at first, it put quite a lot of people off when they soon realized that I was just getting started and had zero clients. I kept going though, I was persistent, and after three months of failure, I finally got my first job, taking care of an elderly lady in her 90s named Joanne. Joanne lived in a small house, it was only a one bed, so it meant that I couldn't do night stay. But Joanne wasn't bad enough to need night stay, she could walk just fine with her walking aid, either a Zimmer frame, walking stick, or when her injury flared up, crutches. I would clean her house, do her cooking, do her washing, laundry, I would even do her yard at times. I got a few more clients, and I reduced my visit to my grandparents to twice a week, because it was just physically impossible to visit them anymore. My pay had now turned into more than full time. I think it was fair to say I was making an absolute killing, while taking care of people that needed me the most. I had been taking care of Joanna for a couple of years. My grandparents had finally completely settled into the care home and were really liking it there. Joanne was deteriorating, however, and it was becoming pretty obvious that she would need night stay very soon. Her son ran a business. He ran it out of Arizona. He was paying for all of her care, and I had a word with him. Joanna started to struggle to get to the toilet. She could now not really walk even with the walking aid, and her condition had deteriorated massively. Her psoriasis was spreading everywhere, and whenever she would fall ill with an infection, it would take her weeks, if not months, just to recover. One evening, I called up to her son. He lived states away and had only seen me on the first day that I came out to Joanna's house. Once I had a call with him, I made it clear that Joanna was deteriorating. She didn't want to admit it, but on the call I stood right next to her and spoke loudly, so she was in the know and had exact closure of what my intentions were. 
Her son didn't even doubt this and decided to hop straight onto the nightcare program. On the first night, things went really well. I caught Joanna trying to walk to the toilet herself, and in the process jumped straight off of the couch and tried to help her. As I said earlier, her house isn't really equipped for night care. However, she got so bad that I didn't really have a choice. I set up my own mini bed and at first was sleeping on the couch. Things were going just fine and the neighbourhood she lived in was extremely peaceful and quiet. That was up until the second week of night stay. I was asleep on the couch as it was way more comfortable than the blow up mattress I had bought from Walmart. All of a sudden I started hearing some banging sounds coming from the front area of the property. I thought that it would be Joanna trying to get to the toilet again, as the last time I caught her trying to do that, she was also kind of holding onto the walls and stumbling from side to side. However, when I called out her name, I could hear that she was still in bed. Joanna? Yes? Where are you? In bed. I thought that something had gone wrong, and that maybe she had fallen out the bed and then climbed back in. So, I decided to get off the couch, put my blanket back down on top of it, and make my way round over to her bedroom. The benefit of the house being so small meant that I could talk to her from any room. The only room that it was hard to hear her in was the bathroom, if she had the door shut while going. As I walked through the door into the corridor, I looked right and was immediately hit by a cool breeze. That's when I realised that the front door was wide open. My heart sank as I thought of the severity of the situation. I was still half asleep and actually believed that Joanna had simply fallen out of bed, but was okay and would maybe recover with nothing but some bruises. The first thing I did was go straight into Joanna's room, and that's when I saw him. I walked in, opened the door, and stood across the bed from her was a man wearing a face mask. In his hand was a handgun, and he was pointing it directly at Joanna, threatening her to stay quiet. Now I'd walked in, he was pointing the gun directly at my chest. I put my hands up, and in those moments, my life flashed back in front of me. I started begging with the mask of intruder and reasoned with them not to kill me. They ordered me over onto the bed with Joanna. I did exactly what they said as the guy raided through her drawers and went through some of the belongings in her property. He went from room to room stealing odd bits, not very much, but he did take jewellery estimated to be around $2,000 worth. He shut the door after himself and was in the property for around a couple of minutes. I called 911 the second he left and locked all of the doors and windows. When the police arrived, they did a search of the property and tried to take some swabs for fingerprints. They never located who this was and never caught the perpetrator. Ever since this happened, we put deadbolts on her doors, we installed ring doorbell cams and took extra precautions, so this never happens again. I've never had a gun pointed directly at me, and the thoughts that I imagined in those few seconds were pretty dark. As a single mother, my son has always been my everything. From the moment he was born, he brought a sense of purpose and joy into my life that I never knew was possible. His bright smile and curious mind never failed to light up my world, and I would do anything to make him happy. Recently, my nine-year-old son has been on a quest to find the perfect drink. 
He had heard about it from his friends at school and was determined to try it for himself. It was called Prime and it was the latest craze among kids his age. With its vibrant colours and unique flavours, it was no surprise that my son was eager to get his hands on it. I'll admit, I was a bit hesitant at first. As a single mother, I always tried to make sure my son had a healthy and balanced diet, but after seeing how much this drink meant to him, I decided to do some research and see what all the fuss was actually about. I soon discovered that Prime was not just any ordinary drink, it was a special drink that the whole world had gone nuts about. It turns out that some YouTubers had made this drink, these just so happened to be YouTubers that my son was subscribed to, and the rest, well, that was history. My son's excitement only grew as he learned more about Prime. He begged me to take him to the store to buy it, but to our disappointment, it was sold out everywhere. Apparently, it was in such high demand that it was constantly out of stock during the first couple of months of its production. But my son was not one to give up easily. He was determined to find this drink and taste it for himself. He begged me to check every store we passed by, hoping that one of them would have it in stock. I couldn't help but smile at his determination and his persistence. And to be honest, even if it was a hundred dollars a bottle, I probably would have just bought it. We searched high and low, from small convenience stores to big grocery store chains, but Prime was nowhere to be found. As a single mother, I didn't have much free time on my hands, but I was willing to do whatever it took to make my son happy. I even asked friends and family to keep an eye out for it, but it seemed like everyone was on the hunt for this elusive drink. As the days went by, my son's disappointment grew. He couldn't understand why a drink that seemed so popular and in demand was so difficult to find. I could see the disappointment in his eyes every time we came back empty-handed. I simply refused to give up. My son's happiness was my top priority, and I was determined to find this drink for him. I started calling stores ahead of time, asking when their next shipment of Prime would be arriving. I even set up alerts on my phone for any stores that had it in stock. My son's thirst for Prime was never quenched. He would constantly ask me about it, and even drew pictures of what he thought the bottle would look like. I couldn't help but smile at his enthusiasm and creativity. One day, after weeks of searching, I received a notification on my phone that a nearby store had Prime in stock. I immediately grabbed my son and we rushed to the store, not wanting to miss our chance. As we ran down the drinks aisle, I could see my son's excitement building, and there it was, sitting on the shelf, the coveted Prime drink. My son was so happy that he ran straight towards it, grabbing a bottle and examining it closely. I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief and joy as I watched my son's face light up. I knew how much this meant to him, and I was glad that I could make it happen. As we made our way to the checkout, my son couldn't stop talking about he couldn't wait to try it. As soon as we got home, my son ripped open the bottle and started gulping. His face lit up with delight, and he exclaimed, This is the best drink ever. I couldn't help but smile as I watched him enjoy his long-awaited prime drink. As a parent, there is nothing more important to me than the health and well-being of my son. Ever since he was born, I've always done my best to provide him with the best of everything, from food to education to experiences. 
I've always strived to give him the best that life has to offer. So when my son developed a sudden love for a rare and highly sought after drink called Prime, I knew that I had to do everything in my power to get it to him. Prime was a drink that had recently taken the world by storm. Naturally, as a parent, the idea of giving my son this drink would make me happy as well as him. However, now he had tasted it, he wanted more, he wanted new colours, new flavours, the limited edition, etc. The problem was, the Prime was so popular that it was nearly impossible to find. It was sold out in every store, and the few online retailers who had it were selling it for extortionate prices. Desperate to get my hands on some consistent amounts of Prime for my son, I turned to Craigslist. I had heard that sometimes people sold rare items on there, so why not? I'm pretty sure it was illegal to resell this, unless you're some registered store, but I knew that somewhere there'd be a random guy selling packs for probably quadruple the price. After hours of scrolling through listings, I finally came across an ad for Prime. The seller claimed to have a large quantity of it, and was offering it as a reasonable price, which kind of surprised me at first. Without hesitation, I contacted the seller, and asked if he was available the next day. I arrived at the designated meeting spot, a small cafe on the outskirts of town, feeling both excited and nervous. The seller, a middle-aged man, greeted me and handed me a bottle of Prime. Behind him were three cases. I inspected it closely, and it looked just like the pictures I had seen online. The packaging didn't look fake, and I had kept the old bottle from my son to bring with me, just to compare the two side by side. The bottle was a deepish shade of blue, with a sleek design, and the word Prime written in bold black letters down the sides. I eagerly handed over the money, and left with the crates after loading them into my trunk. I would finally gotten my hands on some Prime for my son, and I knew that he was going to go crazy as soon as I got through that door. When I got home, I presented the crates to Alex, he began going crazy, jumping up and down, and looked like he was having the most happiest time of his entire life. He had been asking for Prime for weeks now, and finally he had it, and not just one, but around 200 bottles worth. He took a sip, and his face lit up. It's even better, oh my god mum, this flavour's way better. I was relieved, and happy to see him enjoying it so much. However, my happiness was short-lived. The next morning, Alex woke up feeling sick. He had a high fever, and was vomiting. My heart sank, as I kind of realised that it might have something to do with the drinks. I immediately rushed him to the hospital, where some of the doctors confirmed that he had been poisoned. They asked me if he had eaten or drank anything unusual in the past 48 hours, and that's when it hit me. The Prime. I was devastated. How could this have happened? I had been so careful, and even inspected the bottle myself. It wasn't until I looked closely at the bottle that I realised the mistake I had made. The bottle did not have the official Prime logo on it, and somehow I would completely missed that while stood in front of the guy. Upon closer inspection, I could see that the label was slightly off-centre. I had been scammed. The man on Craigslist had sold me a fake bottle of Prime, and worse, it seemed like the drink had been contaminated with some sort of rotten water. As I sat in the hospital with my sick son, who was throwing up his guts, 
I couldn't help but feel guilty. Alex was becoming seriously dehydrated, and they told me that if he was continually sick for another hour or two, they would have to inject him to stop the vomiting in order to save him from severe dehydration. I had been so desperate to get him prime that I'd let my guard down, got desperate, and fell for a scam. I was angry at myself for not being more careful and for putting my son's health at risk. I vowed to never let my desperation cloud my judgement again. After a few days in the hospital, Alex's vomiting stopped. He recovered from his illness. However, the incident had left a lasting impact on both of us. Alex was now hesitant to try new things, and I couldn't blame him. We chucked all the crates out and had them disposed of. I had let him down, and I'd shattered his trust in me. I knew I had to make it up to him, somehow. I decided to take matters into my own hands, and try to find a legitimate source of Prime once again. I scoured the internet, read reviews, and asked around. Determined to find a trustworthy seller, I knew that it was just a matter of time, days, weeks, maybe even months, before this craze finally died down, and the availability became way more easier. After weeks of searching, I finally came across a small, family-owned company that claimed to sell Prime. They were located in a remote village in South America, and their production was limited due to the variety of ingredients that they used. I contacted them and explained my situation, and they were more than willing to help. After a few weeks of waiting, a package arrived at my doorstep. Inside were a couple of crates of Prime, along with a handwritten note from the owner of the company, apologising for the inconvenience and wishing Alex a speedy recovery. I was touched by their kindness and felt a sense of relief knowing that I could finally give my son the genuine Prime that he deserved. When I presented the real Prime to Alex, he was hesitant at first, but after seeing the genuine logo and label, he eagerly took a sip. A smile spread across his face as he tasted the familiar, refreshing flavour. You see, the first time he ever tried Prime, it was the real one, but we only bought one, as there were only three left on the shelf, and I didn't want to be greedy. This is the real Prime, he said, with a grin across his face. I felt a weight lift off my shoulders, as I watched him enjoy the drink, without any ill effects this time. And from that day on, Prime became a regular part of our lives. Alex would often ask for it, and I would happily oblige, knowing that it was the real thing. As a parent, I had learned a valuable lesson, to never let desperation cloud my judgement, and to always prioritise the safety and well-being of my son above all else. Looking back, I'm grateful for the experience. It taught me to be more cautious and to do thorough research before making any decisions. Most importantly, it reminded me that the love and care we show for our kids is more valuable than any rare or expensive item. As for Prime, it may have its benefits, but nothing compares to the love and happiness that comes from a healthy and happy son.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me in today's stories. We are now well over a hundred for the Craigslist Horror Stories edition. If you enjoy this channel and you're not yet subscribed, please do. It says on my analytics that most of my viewers actually are not subscribed, which is kind of sad to be honest, as I work very hard on this channel to bring you guys daily uploads. There aren't many other horror story channels on YouTube that post every day, and if they do, they're usually only around 5-10 to 10 minutes. I think I'm up there with one of the most consistent channels on YouTube, so please, if you can, subscribe, if you aren't already that is, you can only subscribe once, and leave a like on today's video as well, as that helps the channel grow and it means a lot to me also. If you want to comment down below, feel free to as well. You can give your opinions on any of the stories, you can criticise the stories, or you can give your advice to the people who wrote them. They're probably reading the comments, or some of them are. I can't guarantee every single one of them are. Lastly, if you want to support the channel that bit more, please share my videos with your friends, family, please share my videos with Facebook groups you're in, WhatsApp group chats, and anyone else you think who might benefit from my videos. These stories are created with the idea of helping people sleep, helping people study, and helping people get through work. I really, really work hard in this channel, and I don't ask for any donations. I don't sell any silly t-shirts or merchandise. All I ask is that you guys stay with me and continue to support me through this journey. Thank you, and I'll catch you tomorrow evening.